Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 10 of Whistlekick Live. Yes, this is the 10th month in a row that we have done this, which is completely ridiculous to me. I can't believe it's still going. I can't believe that we're still making this happen. Well, one of the things I want to let you know, something different today, you will notice my hands are off. I have hands off on the controls. This is an evolution of the show. We've got Gabe running the controls. Yes, this is the big change. Now, for those of you that don't know, Gabe has been the one putting together all the awesome content from from the beginning. He's been killing it, coming up with great stuff for me to talk about, photos and videos for us to look at and react to, and it's been a lot of fun. And we, after each episode, we kind of we kind of debrief and say, how do we make it better? And I said, you know, you know, what we, we want to do next time. I want you to run the controls, so I can just do this because that's been one of the problems. It's been not problem. That's been one of the challenges for me is having is running the board, so to speak, and then dealing with the content and trying to be present for all of you and. Right now, Gabe is remoted into my computer. He can see all of my deepest, darkest secrets, and I can't do anything about it, uh, but I trust him, so I think we'll be good. I think we're all right there. Uh, and I want to shout out everybody that's... I'm not going to shout out everybody. I want to thank everybody that's watching. I appreciate it. And so let's see how this show goes. Apparently, I'm looking at uh, energy drinks. Kicks energy... Are these energy... No, these are firecrackers. Fireworks. Okay, that makes that makes more sense. Caution emits showers of, of sparks. Okay, so here is some sort of martial arts themed. Yeah, I see a foot uh, in the graphics. Some sort of martial arts themed fireworks going on here. And more martial arts themed fireworks. I mean, of course, you know, we just had the 4th of July Independence Day here in the U.S. I'm assuming everybody watching is in the U.S. just given the time of day, but maybe not. Uh, ninja caution emits showers of sparks. See now, all all these are doing are making me want to go outside and blow things up. And uh, that's not something I generally want to do. And now there's a video of things blowing up. I don't know why. What is happening? What is blowing up? It's. I mean, it's clearly whatever it is. It's sitting on an old wire spool. I've moved enough of those in my day. More fireworks. Maybe it's a UFO. Wait for it. Okay, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. How far did this thing launch? Okay, it's pretty colors. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of fireworks. True story. I find them to be a lot of buildup with not a whole lot of actual substance. Because think about it. When growing up, um, going to watch fireworks was something that my mother and I did every year. And we'd go one town over. And it would, I think, from start to from, from leaving the house to getting there to the fireworks, we would have to leave the house at like 5.30. Because everybody would come from miles around for these fireworks. And the fireworks would start at like 9, 9.30. So it's four hours. And then it's maybe a 20, let's say 30 minute show. And then you got to wait two hours to go to your car. Because everybody tries to leave at once. And then you get in the car and you sit there for an hour trying to leave. And by the time you're all done, it's like a six hour process for 30 minutes of fireworks. Meh. Now, if I'm lighting the fireworks and blowing them up in my backyard, totally different story. Totally different story. In completely other news. <laughs> so back on episode 499, we were kind of doing a recap of a lot of the things that have happened over the last five years of martial arts radio. And I offhandedly mentioned that one of the products that we've done that has been discontinuing were belts. And... So let's find out, is anybody in this mix right now, anybody watching, do you have a belt? I actually got an email from somebody saying 
that they had heard that in the episode. They have their black belt is a whistle kick black belt, and maybe it'll be a collector's item someday. I don't know. It's it's not signed or anything. How would you sign a black belt? I guess I have a silver marker. I could sign that. But who knows? If you've got one, save it. And we've got some comments coming through here. I'm going to read off some of this stuff if I can get this computer to cooperate. There we go. We're doing things separate computers. It's like it's like mission control in here right now. It's crazy. Uh, go, Gabe, go. <laughs> Oh, uh, Gabe, they're already mocking us in our, in our conversations. It's fine. Yeah, it sounds like what you hear in a bomb shelter during rocket attacks. Ooh, that sounds like it's spoken from experience. Slow-mo videos of fireworks are awesome. I agree. I had to go from Glenside to Abington. I don't know where that is. And wait in line to find a spot. It was too much for the amount of time it took. Sadly, no. Silver marker. I'm a red black belt, but belong to Action Karate. Oh, well, welcome. Yeah, we only released solid colors, and the plan was we were going to do com combinations and stripes and everything, but the factory that did the belts uh, didn't. The ones that came out good were great. The ones that did not, uh, they, they took ends of belts and sewed them together, and it just, it was a whole scene. It was a mess. One of the things that we do here at Whistlekick, we've put a lot of effort into our social media. And if you're not following us all over the place, you should be. Where are we? We're on Twitter, where I interact with people when I remember to, which is like twice a month. <laughs> uh, Instagram is where we're putting a lot of work in right now. Facebook, of course. And if you're watching us, you're probably, if you're watching us live, you're definitely on Facebook. And YouTube, where we will rebroadcast this tomorrow night as well. But we're also on Tumblr. I don't know if anything shows up there, but uh, recently we've been putting some time into Pinterest. So you might want to check out Pinterest. If you're, if you are a, a pinner, which is what I understand the, the noun of people who use Pinterest to be, which is way cooler than saying a Facebooker or an Instagrammer. Pinner at least has like, I don't know, there's some substance there. It's kind of neat. <laughs> Eric says nothing but love. Hey, you guys can 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 pick and play all you want. Totally fine. I'm I'm down for it. I, I we fortunately have not grown to the point where people are going to invest their time to come hate on what's going on. Um, I hope to, I aspire to reach that point at some at some time. <laughs> Pull that back up. So the. This one here, Stacy in the chat saying that she said this. I've said this. I, this was the initial inspiration. I did two. This is back when I did the social media. I did two, ten, um, you know your martial artist if sets. I think this was the, was in the first one. And this launched like a whole bunch of our social media. And I actually have notes to to do another block of 10. I don't know when that'll happen. It's, it was going to happen today and now it got pushed off till tomorrow. My calendar is a mess, but it's fun, right? It's, it's, it's fun to poke fun at ourselves. What we do as martial artists is ridiculous. And that's one of the things that we try to bring forward in our social media. If you could tell your instructor how to give you critiques, how to give you criticism, what would you say? I respond best to some balance, um, some positive and some constructive. I don't do well with negative. I don't like when my coaches, my instructors say, hey, that sucked. If it was that bad, I'll probably know that it sucked and I don't need you to tell me. If you tell me, I'm probably just going to feel badly about myself. And that's not how you get the best out of me. There are some people out there who I've worked with who like being torn down. I don't, I don't know why. I don't empathize with that. But hey, you know, different strokes for different folks. The first time I saw my teacher in his normal clothing, it was weird. <laughs> this was very much my reality when I was a full-time instructor. Yeah. <laughs> This one I identify with, without a doubt. You do something perfectly, a whole bunch. The moment the instructor watches, 
that's the one that falls apart. It goes out the window and I've even told my instructor, can you turn around again a few times and then, and then look when I'm not paying attention? Because I'll do it right when you see that. I think as an instructor, learning how to motivate people is one of the most important skill sets. And it's one that is really difficult because it's not universal and it's not consistent. Diff if, if you think about the ways you can motivate people, you've got positive, you've got negative, you've got constructive, you've got demonstrative, showing people things, you've got kinesthetic where you might actually like, hey, do this. And they're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Right. And so you've got that and more and different combinations work. And I don't know about you, but on different days, I need different things. Sometimes on a good day, I don't need as much. If I've had a bad day, maybe I need a little bit more, I don't know, coddling. Not really. I don't need coddling, but I think you know what I mean. That sometimes we need different things. And the best instructors can read what you need and deliver it even when you don't know what that is. I've had instructors that have pushed me when I didn't know that that's what I wanted. As people, we all like to be complimented and encouraged, but as martial artists, we also look to be critiqued so we can improve. How do you find that balance as a student or instructor? Mm. I think it depends on where the focus is. What's the priority? Is the priority on getting better or as an instructor helping your students get better? Or is it on them leaving and feeling really good about themselves? Because the two are really different. And it's okay, again, to play differently to different people because different students need different things. At the end of the day, what is the job of a student? to learn, to give their best, to show up and try to get better versus the day before. As, a, as an instructor, what's the job? The job is to help students do that, is to foster their growth. And if that's the priority for each side, the rest of it tends to fall into place in my experience. Eric says, positive reinforcing is great, but not when you're really wanting to push past the black belt plateau. I think that can depend on the individual. I think a lot of black belts know they need to be pushed and a lot of black belts want to be pushed. I've known martial arts students who are so focused on getting better that they don't want to even hear what they've done right. Okay, great. I did that right. I don't care. Tell me what I did wrong. Tell me how to get better. Where, where's the progress? Help me move things forward. I think the big thing is if it's constructive or destructive. Basically, if you listen and say, okay, this is what I need you to do better. Yes, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> Bubbles. If anybody hasn't watched Trailer Park Boys, uh, you might not get where this meme comes from, but that's where that's coming from. When everyone in class understands the technique and you're all sitting there like, yeah, I've been there. I've definitely been there. Uh, I won't say I've been there a lot, but I've been there enough that I can I can certainly relate to this. There are times where maybe it's been a long day, just I'm not firing on all cylinders, and I take a look at something and say, what is this? I don't, I don't I know this form. Are you sure I know this form? Are you sure I've done this before? I, I don't know. Maybe I disagree. Let's talk about zero gravity. In honor of the successful SpaceX launch, those of you who didn't follow, that got delayed like what, three times, four times? And finally, a private group put a rocket up with people on it. Let's suppose humans make it to another planet someday. What would the martial arts look like with less gravity? Grappling, throwing, is ugh, people sending me messages throwing and, and honestly let, let me even pull that back more from there everything we do in martial arts comes with our relationship to the ground if you're kicking the better you're grounded the more powerful your kick 
if you if you jump, you're probably not going to kick as high. Why? Because you don't have as much ground to push off of. If you're looking for the most powerful kick possible, unless you're just throwing your body at it and you have weak legs, a jumping kick is not as powerful. If you're trying to throw someone, you have to be stable to get that throw. So if you have less gravity, you have less of a relationship with the ground. But you could do cool things, right? You could jump, you could fly around. Um, instead of doing a jump spinning hook kick, you might be able to do a jump six times around spinning hook kick. Extreme martial arts, I think, would take off. We would get broadcasts of people doing martial arts on the moon and they would step in and they would bow and they would start their opening technique and their form in the extreme division and they would still be going when the clock ran out. Kind of like this. Kind of like this scene from Crouching Tiger 2? Pretty sure? I'm looking I'm looking to Gabe to see if it is too. He doesn't know. Okay. Um, for those of you that don't know, Gabe and I also have a, a, a real-time video chat going to my left. So we can we can just kind of touch base to make sure everything's going okay. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is Crouching Tiger 2 is that the cinematography from the first to the second one were, were pretty different stylistically. Um, it, the first one was a lot greener and darker, and this looks grayer and brighter. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I'm going with. First one, probably still my favorite martial arts movie. So good. Imagine you're choreographing a fight scene in a space station. Now there's less gravity, so you've got all the physics you've got to deal with if you want to make it look realistic. What would be your approach? Now this was a question that I think you posed, Gabe. I posed? I did it. Apparently I posed this. I don't remember doing this. Apparently I asked this question in the martial arts fun and friends group. If you're not part of that group, you should join that group. Super good time. And The, the responses were pretty good. There were a lot of people um, really had some fun with it. Talking about weapons and using environments and things like that. And I think it's a good mental exercise. If you train at a school where you practice choreography, where you make up routines, or, or even if you don't, this would be a fun one. What does martial arts look like without gravity? Play with it. If you have rafters that you can hang things from, not going to be super specific on this because I don't want someone to sue me, but there are ways that you could suspend someone and they could train while hovering. You could, you could figure that out. That'd be kind of cool. And if you do that, I would like to see it. Now this next question we got, this one was submitted by Andrew Adams who just popped into the chat. So hello Andrew, what did you miss? Uh, you missed the first 22 minutes of fun stuff. Oh, great question. Now I'm going to make some word substitution here. What makes a dojo a dojo? What makes a, a, a martial arts school? What makes it different from a club? Hmm. I think a lot of people are going to have different answers on this one. And those of you in the chat, I would love to hear your opinions. You know, what makes a dojo, a dojang, an academy? What makes that different from a club? And I think my difference could be summed up as a dojo or other terminology for the, the same environment. That space is dedicated to the purpose of martial arts growth. A club exists so, solely because there are groups of people who want to get better at martial arts and they will train elsewhere. So the dojo or dojang or whatever, right? I try to be um, style agnostic that the space is the difference. A club exists within a dojo, right? It's a group of people who want to train. 
but when they're within a dojo, they have the added benefit of a dedicated training space. Does that mean, here's, here's the counter, does that mean that if you run a martial arts school and you are training in a church basement, that you are not training in a dojo? Yes and no. While you are training, that is a dojo. The moment you stop training, it's no longer a dojo. That's the difference. If I, well, it's Andrew's question, so I'm going to use Andrew as the example. Andrew converted a shed in his backyard to a dojo. Once he did that conversion, I didn't see any lawnmowers hanging out, ready to go back in there. It is a dojo. It is always a do dojo. And it will remain a dojo until it is no longer a dojo. It doesn't flip back and forth between dojo and high school gymnasium. So Andrew's saying, so a school that teaches in a, a VFW of veterans of foreign wars once or twice a week would be a club because the space isn't dedicated to only martial arts. So I'm using the terminology to define the space. You may have posed the question about the group of people, and I'm not going to make a difference in the group of people. I'm simply talking about the space. Is there a benefit to having a dedicated training space? Yes. Does that mean that real, true, quality martial arts cannot exist without being in a dedicated space? No. In fact, I have seen the exact opposite at far too many places to say that it is a necessity. Stacy says, it has learning and spirit at its heart. It does not matter location. A club sounds more like a group for fun to me. It does not have to have a higher purpose or a poker club. This, this is a deep conversation and this is one that we could probably spend a lot of time on. Uh, I think this, did this end up in Fun and Friends? Gabe, did this question end up in Fun and Friends? If it didn't, it did? Okay, I missed this one. I missed how this one came through then. Uh, I, I need to go back and look and see what everybody else said because it's a great question. What's next? <laughs> now, of course, you've all seen this format from time to time. Martial arts instructor, what my friends think I do. We've got a picture of Miyagi with the chopsticks. What my students think I do. It's a drill sergeant. What instructors of other arts think I do. Uh, it's a, is that Steve Martin playing the ukulele? Uh, what my white belts think I do, it's someone breaking rocks. What I think I do, it's people training at a Shaolin temple. And what I really do, what I really do, it's a kid kicking the instructor in the groin. Good times. Very good times. I, you know what I love about this format of meme, the reality that's in there. I've seen so many of them. I've seen them for every martial arts style you can imagine. I've seen them for boxing and wrestling, for teaching, uh, you know, non-martial arts, just everything. It's so true. They're all so true. And I think it's really important that we learn how to laugh at ourselves. So I love when we have these pop through because they're funny. Good times. Is your favorite aspect of martial arts training also your favorite to watch? Ah, if not, what is it and why? No. You know what my favorite thing to train it consistently is? You're gonna think I'm you're gonna think I'm lying. It's basics. But it's not single punches down and back on the floor. It's combinations of basics. It's you take a movement and you do it five times, and then the instructor adds another movement and you do the combination of those two a few more times, and then you do another movement and you take it, how far can you get before people can't remember it? And depending on the group and the movements you pick, you, you can get, I've had people get 10, 15 movements in. That's really fun because it makes you think, it makes the instructor think, it's a, it, it's a great way to do basics. And I just, I love basics because I love being able to just focus on what I'm doing. My favorite thing to watch is either forms or sparring 
depending on who's doing it. If I have been sitting in a chair for three hours and I'm gonna watch another orange belt do Pinyon Shodan for the 74th time that day, I don't wanna watch that. But if I'm watching someone who's really gifted at forms and they do a wonderful performance, I will watch that all day. That is the best. Anybody else have a comment in here? Look, we got more people coming in. I appreciate everybody joining us in the chat. If you've got something to say, say it, and I'll do my best to catch it and bring it back in. This is one of the places where the time delay kind of stinks, but we work with what we have, right? How do you find motivation for something that doesn't excite you? You have to look at what you're doing. You have to look at why you're doing it. So let's say, here's a great example. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to have to do the books for Whistlekick, the financial books. I do them every week because if I don't do them every week, I do them like once a month and it takes way too long. I don't like doing the books. It is not fun to me. Uh, I don't like looking at how much money we don't have. <laughs> Just flat out. So why do I do it? because I need to know how much money we don't have. It's, there are lots of things that we have to do. And I'll bring this back to martial arts in a moment. There are lots of things that we have to do in life that we don't want to do, right? I mean, we all know that. I, I assume everybody watching is an adult. But in order to do things that are important to you, you find that motivation. Everything we do is a choice. And sometimes people will push back on that. And I don't, I don't pay my taxes by choice. You absolutely do. You have a choice. You could go to jail. You could not pay your taxes and go to jail. You could not go to work and get evicted. There's choice. And once you recognize that there's choice, you can see that you have motivation to do something versus something else. Now, when we're talking about martial arts, let's say you're not motivated to do forms. Plenty of people. And, and I, 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 know many of you because you write to me and say can you give me some reasons why forms are dumb and i can tell my instructor so we can stop doing them and i say no because they're not but let's say forms don't motivate you you've got a number of reasons that that could be that you might find some motivation first the more you work on the things you are worst at the better you get as a martial artist Yes, if you stink at forms, as you get better at forms, it will make everything else you do better. Uh, two, if you care about rank promotion, you probably need to work on your forms. Three, you could take it as a personal challenge. How do I find something in this that I really enjoy? There was a point in time where I absolutely hated fighting. As you, many of you know, I am not a tall man. I am five foot seven. I've been five foot seven for a long time. When I was a kid, I was very short. So I would get crushed sparring because my legs were shorter than lots of people's arms. That's not terribly motivating, but I found some ways to have fun because the, st it, it, the standard became not winning, but maybe I can get a point on this person, or maybe I can just take longer to lose. You have to find something. And if you're not willing to find something, it just means that it's not important to you. When you feel like quitting, think about why you started. Probably the most important advice you can get. And what's funny is I almost wore the whistle kick shirt that has this on the back. I almost wore that for this show. Got to make some new shirts. Most of my shirts have been retired and they're in the archive in the, in the, uh, the warehouse. Mm, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah, just I'm, I'm watching people responding to some of this stuff in the chat. They're talking among themselves, and I really like that. It's cool. I always feel like you can talk among yourselves. You don't have to. It doesn't have to just be addressed to me. You can, you can comment. I'm going to watch. It's cool. Now, this is something I've seen this pop up in a number of news articles, and I've had several people write to me and say, hey, are you going to get this person on the show? Uh, maybe. But I think one of the challenges is that I don't know if this person speaks English. Japan, I, I, didn't, I don't think I read that yet, Gabe. Can you go back? Japan has produced its first graduate 
its first ninja studies graduate. Now, first off, uh, I am disappointed that that person is not me. And secondly, that I was not invited to participate. Not like as an instructor, but I want to go to a ninja school. Who doesn't want to go to ninja school? That's way better than any other kind of school. Come on. And I think I'm assuming this is an image of this Ninja Studies program that we've got coming up. Yes. All right. So what we see are a handful of people with bows. I see a guy on the left with, I don't know what, it's, it's retracted. This is a long bow. It's longer than typical. And then you've got these two people on the right that have bent bows. I'm not really sure what's going on there. I'm not, I don't know what's happening. I don't at all know what's happening. They just, they look bent. Why are they bent? And that, hold on, go back, go back one second. Everybody's barefoot except for, except for this person. I'm stealing the mouse. Except for this person right here who's got like these really colorful shoes going on. What's happening there? Why has this guy got colorful shoes? And then this guy's got a black boken. I don't know, some kind of stick. All right, you can have the mouse. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know who graduated, but I would I would talk to them. I would like to talk to them. CJ says, I will go with you to ninja school. Cool, we can room together. I really, I really want to buy, again, with my negative dollars, I want to buy one of these um, smaller colleges that have gone out of business and just turn it into a martial residential martial arts school. That's I really, really want to do this. Uh, Andrew's asking if that's a Naginata uh, on the right-hand side of the image. It might be. It might be the wooden equivalent of a Naginata, uh, which for those of you who may be unfamiliar is a large bladed, think of like a, a short butter knife, but sword-like on the end of a stick. That's a Naginata. Oh, Jason agrees. Looks like a Naginata. <laughs> so much for being a secret. Yeah. The guy in the middle is the graduate. His name is Genichi Mitsuhashi. It's a two-year degree. So it's not, a, it's not a certificate program. It's like an associate's. He has, he has an associate's degree in being a ninja. What are the prerequisites? What... What does that entitle him to do? What does his certificate look like? How well can he fight? Was there a class on smoke bombs? These are the questions I have. And I want to ask these questions and many more of this gentleman. If you know me, if you spend any time with me, you know I love dogs. And just over the weekend, I, I got out of my car and there was there was a dog looking at me and the family was kind of looking at the dog. And so I said, can I, can I say hi to your dog? I didn't introduce myself. I just went over and started petting the dog. But what if dogs could do martial arts? Ever wondered if dogs could practice martial arts? Um, my dog growing up was pretty good at grabbing the foam nunchaku. I had uh, uh, several pairs of foam nunchucks. I will not call them numchucks. I will call them nunchucks. Uh, and if I was swinging them, and this happened the first time, like just completely out of the blue, I was just swinging them around, pretending, you know, that I had gone to ninja school and I'm probably 10 at the time, maybe 11. And the dog just grabs an end and pulls it out of my hand and runs away. So she's got foam nunchucks hanging out of her mouth. And she would she would do stuff like that. And then as I got old, you know, we would we would we would sort of spar. You know, I I kick at her and she'd jump around and you know it was fun. Now uh, I will practice punching at the cat, and she is far less engaged with that. Um, if I if I do particularly fast movements, she'll bite at my hand. She really she's not she's not game for it. Uh, classes on poison. Uh, 
how would you get deliveries if it's meant to be secret class on smoke bombs that sounds tricky yes um, Tommy says he practices with his dog all the time he roots really really well <laughs> ninja hounds it sounds like this could be a uh, sounds like it could be a ninja turtle spinoff hmm there's something going on. I, I've, got, I've got to keep talking, I was told. Gabe's doing something here on the other screen, and I'm pretending that I'm not watching, but I'm watching. And uh, what do we got? Oh, okay. There's more. Um, bring that back up. It looks like you have more information about uh, the martial arts, uh, about the ninja studies. Yeah, uh, let me read that. Japan has produced its first ninja studies graduate after Genichi Mitsuhashi spent two years honing his martial arts skills and absorbing the finer traditions of the feudal martial arts agents at Mie University in central Japan, the region considered the home of the ninja. This is a quote. I read that ninjas worked as farmers in the morning and trained in martial arts in the afternoon, end quote. He said, so Mitsuhashi grew vegetables and worked on his martial arts techniques in addition to copious ninja study in the classroom. He also practices Shorinji Kempo, teaches ninja skills at his own dojo, and runs a local inn while pursuing his PhD. Okay, this sounds very much like what my, my what my life is. I wake up, I do first cup, I go out and I tend the gardens, I come back in, I do whistle kick stuff, and in between there, I train and do other things. Now, none of it is ninja-like. I'm not poisoning people. I'm not taking classes on smoke bombs. But now I really want to. See, that ties back to the fireworks. What would ninja a ninja fireworks display look like? Oh, I feel like there's a joke there somewhere. It would be it would be one smoke bomb and then everybody waiting for an hour for the rest of the show. <laughs> oh. Poison was a major tool of ninja. A katana. Ah. <laughs> a cat wielding a sword. That would be great. Ever wonder if dogs could practice martial arts? The sport of Schutzhund might be the closest we'll get. According to Wikipedia, Schutzhund is a dog sport that was developed in Germany in the early 1900s as a breed suitability test for the German Shepherd. Today is used as a sport where many breeds can compete, but it's such a demanding test that few dogs can pass. One trainer described it like teaching a dog martial arts. Okay, so first off, this, this thing for dogs is older than just about every martial art we practice. So that's funny. And, oh, you got to put that up on screen. How is this guy barefoot? Look at this. He's, he's wearing, he's wearing a ton of protective gear and no shoes. Anybody who's had a dog has had their dog step on their foot and the claw has gone right in between the bones on the top of your foot and it hurts like heck and how has that guy not had that happen because this is insane to me the dogs to me it looks more like dog parkour what's he carrying what is that like a like a dumbbell is that like a 10 12 pound dumbbell the dog's carrying as he's jumping over this a-frame that's insane you have more pictures <laughs> is, this, is this part of Schutzhund? <laughs> because that just looks like teasing the dog, which is exactly what I would do. Oh, there's another dog with a dumbbell. This one looks like it's wooden. The other one's probably wooden too. And what's what's the purpose of this? What? Do, why do they do this? Just to make dogs work out? The art of perfection. Okay, it's it's agility. It's defense. More defense. Okay, so and it's a German Shepherd in all of these images, so I'm guessing it was some um, some program developed to make German Shepherds good working and defense dogs. Tom, Tommy says that hurts like hell. Yeah, yeah. Dog stepping on your feet sucks. Uh, in describing the variety in training, another trainer said her dogs could, quote, take a man down in a minute or go to a playground and hang out with all the kids. I mean, that's kind of what you want in a dog. 
that's that's the dream to have a dog that knows how to fight when fighting is appropriate and play when playing is appropriate i mean that, that's kind of martial arts too isn't it yeah yeah that leads into the con we've had a lot of conversation about what a warrior is and it isn't over probably the last six months and that's the equivalency of of dog warriors <coughs> <laughs> That was good times. Nothing like a Mortal Kombat esque dog and cat fight. There we go. Now I can see what's happening. Yeah. You know, you know what's really interesting is dogs and cats are, are, are presented as these mortal em enemies, and they just, I see far more examples of cats, you know, sitting on dogs' heads and dogs just not caring. I'm not really sure how often that happens. My cat has no interest in dogs, and, and um, but she also has no interest in anyone. She kind of hates everything. She's, she's very uh, nihilistic in that way. <laughs> you may have seen this. this. This made the rounds on social media. Coronavirus claims a black belt. Chuck Norris, dead at, 70, dead at 77. Carlos Ray, Chuck Norris, famous actor and fighter, died yesterday afternoon at his home in Northwood Hills, Texas, at the age of 77. Chuck starred in dozens of movies and TV series which have and continue to entertain millions of people. He was also a master of martial arts, which was the cause of his initial fame in the movie industry. However, after his minor inconvenience of death, Chuck has made a full recovery and is reported to be doing quite well. <laughs> I think he's older than 77, though. I thought he just turned 80. He's still in, he's in pretty good shape. Look at that. Look at that face. That is the face of a man who would put his fist through your skull in a moment. Chuck Norris kicks the horse's chin once. We call their descendants giraffes. <laughs> Chuck Norris jokes are the best. If you don't know the history on Chuck Norris jokes, you should look it up. Because initially he tried to suppress them. And what's ironic is had they not become what they are, he wouldn't be relevant anymore. Oh. Are you trying to get me to end on a yelling streak? <laughs> what are your thoughts on participation trophies? Oh, uh, I think they're stupid. Next. No. Um, I think I've done an episode of Martial Arts Radio on this. Here's the thing. On the one side, you have people who need to have... We tackled this on First Cup, didn't we? We talked about this on First Cup. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, we do a morning show. Uh, weekdays, 6.30 Eastern, where people write in and I respond to stuff. And um, a few weeks ago, the, the subject of, of uh, participation, participation trophies came up again. And I had some ideas that I hadn't had in the past. Because here's the thing with participation trophies. you got two sides. On the one side, you have wanting to incentivize people to come to an event and to have a good time and leave with good memories and for young children to find some value in their day. And we all know kids like toys and prizes and presents. And then on the other side, you have real life and the fact that people don't just hand you things for participating and the notion that maybe a participation award sets a false expectation for how the world works. My suggestion is that instead of it being a participation award or a participation trophy, it's something commemorative. You hand out a commemorative patch or a pin or something that doesn't say you earned a place or you even competed, but that you were there. And that gives you the option of doing a lot more stuff and putting a much more positive spin on it. If you're a promoter, Maybe people want to collect patches from each year. 
And we've got a couple comments from people. Uh, Laura says, for the youngest kids, like 600, sure. They don't know a last place from a first place in most situations and are just super happy to get anything. Over that, nope. Kids know how they did and last place is still last place even if you walk away with a medal. CJ says, not a fan. I believe you need to earn what you receive. Leslie says, I don't mind something like a certificate or something small as a souvenir, especially for younger kids, but there should be a proper trophy for winning and placing. I personally find it annoying when I'm in a tiny division and end up taking home a trophy when I know I wasn't at my best, but there just weren't any other people in my group. This has happened to my kids before and they don't enjoy it either. Taking second place in a division of three isn't as much fun as taking third in a division of 10. Yes. People that have kids get it. That's just been my experience. And here we have my definitive thoughts on the subject that will exist in perpetuity. The idea of participation awards is a paradox. An award is given when you do something exceptional. Participating, by definition, is the minimum you can do. And what I find interesting about this is when we've posted this on social media, people have pushed back on it. Well, what if it's really hard for someone to participate? I didn't say there isn't value in participation. I didn't say that it's not hard for some people to do stuff. I said that you shouldn't give people awards for participating. There's a whole difference there. Tommy says um, Ed Parker's tournament, uh, the Long Beach, Invi Long Beach Invitational, I think that's the official title, uh, gives out a patch. Yeah, it, it's participation awards, man. I don't get, I don't jive with them. Never gonna. This is from Gabe. I was talking to a friend who doesn't train in the martial arts and he told me that he didn't think training with so-called ancient weapons like swords and staves was effective. So I picked up a four foot paint roller extension handle and hit him with it. <laughs> what did he say when you did that? Did he have a response? Did he change his mind? Oh, there's a cat. Hi, cat. He's trying to type. He subsequently agreed with me. All right, right on. Generally, if you hit somebody with with a stick, they'll they'll get it. I I keep joking, and I, I've said this enough times that I really just need to I just need to do it. That I'm just going to show up with like a, a plastic rake at a tournament and compete. You know, just bring in the most ridiculous weapons, you know, like, uh, well, we, we play this game like every time, like, what do I have nearby? I mean, I have, I have a knife, but I've also got a keyboard or, uh, you know, I'll murder somebody with a thumb drive, you know, there's options. <laughs> so this is so completely accurate. Uh, it's two side by sides. And for anybody who's watching and you're wondering why I'm describing this is because some people listen to this in audio form later. It's two side by sides of the Ninja Turtle Donatello and the left is captioned four year old me with an empty wrapping paper tube. And for those of you who are not Ninja Turtle aficionados, you may not know that Donatello's weapon was a, was a bow. And then the right side is 34 year old me with an empty wrapping paper tube. Yes. And what's funny was I used to do this with my dog and this was another time where we would fight and she would inevitably bite the tube and rip it away from me. And then that would become two. So it was, well, in, take that back. It went from staff to, they were attached. So then they were nunchaku. So then I was swinging wrapping paper tube or, yeah, nunchaku at the dog. And then she'd grab one end and pull it. So then I had two separate pieces. So then it was kind of like a screamer and I would, I would bop her with it and we had a good time and she's been gone a long time and I still miss her. She was a great dog. Ooh, I like this one. Should the etiquette we show in class be exercised outside of class? It depends on what you mean by etiquette. If etiquette 
is sentiment, yes. If etiquette is also action, no. I will always default to using someone's title if I know them via a martial arts circumstance outside of training. If, if I know Hanchi Bob Boberson through martial arts and I call him Hanchi while we're training, when I'm outside of training, I'm not just going to walk up and call him Bob. Because I also... Because I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to anybody. I will default to calling people sir or ma'am in life because I think that's an appropriate thing to do. You let people pull formality back. You don't start informal. But I think that some people take it too far. I am always and forever Jeremy. Sometimes I'm Sensei Jeremy. Sometimes, depending on where I'm training, I'm Mr. Lesniak. Those are fine. But I don't need to hold on to those titles outside. It, it, all right, I'm going to go on record with this. Insisting on people using titles to refer to you outside of a training environment is the same as you wearing your belt everywhere. Someone calling you, insisting someone at the grocery store call you Shihan is the same as you wearing your belt to the grocery store. Okay. Uh, we had a couple of responses. Here, where did, where did that adequate question go? Here we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt says, absolutely, although I'm guilty of not often showing the etiquette outside. Stacy says, yes, indeed. So again, it depends on how you define etiquette. Is etiquette sentiment or is etiquette also action? If it's action, maybe not. I'm doing a live show. I can't feed you now. You have to wait. I put food in your dish before I started. From the perspective of someone who has never trained in the martial arts, but only been exposed to movies and video games, what would they think the martial arts is all about? They're going to think it's about fighting and being the best fighter and uh, probably doing this with your nose this and you know what there are people who I mean, i'm sure there are people who do that with their nose but there are people who think that martial arts is about fighting and that that is the heart of it and i can't i can't explain it any better than i have many many times it's not and if people want to continue to think it is that's their choice uh, <laughs> Michigan State University used to have a tournament with a ridiculous weapons category. I will never forget a gentleman took first place and his weapons were three foot long salad fork and spoon. That's amazing. Jason, if you can find photos or video of that performance, I would love to show it on the next episode. That would be phenomenal. See, this is, this is the kind of stuff that I want from the, the folks in the chat. I want you to add value and I want you to I want you to email me this stuff so we can add it in on the next episode. And look at this. The hour's almost gone already. This has gone much better. Gabe's killing it. Gabe's killing it in the control room. Thumbs up. <laughs> I had to mute this. So we can't talk over here obviously because I'm talking to you, but we worked out some hand signals and none of them are inappropriate. I just want you to know. What do we what do we got to end on? What are we what are we doing? Okay, yes. So we got a couple of responses there. Stacy says for people who have never trained, they're gonna think it's about making strange sounds. Pete says, nice to hear from Pete. I haven't talked to him in ages. Heaven only knows, but try a class and you'll have a much better understanding. Beautiful response. Oh, where did that go? <laughs> 
All right. Let's let's save that. Let's we'll save that for next time. I want to thank everybody for coming by. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank those of you in the chat who contributed. I hope you enjoyed your time. Remember, we do this show every month. First Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern, and it'll go live on YouTube tomorrow night, and it'll go on the podcast feed so you can catch it as an audio later on. If you're someone who's listening to the audio or someone who's watching the rebroadcast on YouTube, come join us live. It's a lot of fun, and as you can tell, we're putting a lot of work into it. Gabe is doing a great, great job. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate this, and we keep finding new ways to make it a little bit better each time. 15%, we're going for 15% better each time. So thank you for that. And that's it. So I hope you all had a good time. I hope you learned something. And if you didn't learn something, you at least smiled or laughed. And if you didn't have either of those things, I hope it was better than whatever other miserable thing you were going to do was. I hope it was less terrible. So thank you so much. I will... See you back here in a month. Maybe I'll see some of you tomorrow morning for First Cup, 6 or 8 a.m. on YouTube. Take care, everybody.